you guys yeah. tried to raise money and so nothing really materialized to nothing materialized on the west coast at all and what were you guys thinking when that happened uh, we were just trying to find a way to keep it going. It was it was a matter Did of like. Did you deplete all your all your your oh, savings? Yeah, it was it was, yeah. it was gone. <laughs> it was it was gone a while back. Yeah. Um, were these dark times for you and your co-founder? It, they they were. Uh, okay, we we, we managed. <laughs> <laughs> this is startup to storefront. Today's guest is Gaurav Tan, co-founder and chief technical officer of Buttery. Buttery was an on-demand alcohol delivery app that ran in four cities across the U.S. before it was bought by Drizzly, one of their competitors. Garv is a skilled software engineer and responsible for developing and coding the app, as well as the back end of the website, which was part of the reason why they were such an appealing acquisition for Drizzly. So listen in as we cover everything from dealing with the competition in their early days, to sometimes having to make alcohol deliveries himself, and the thought process behind selling the company he and his co-founder worked so hard to build. And you can also listen for the occasional honking from angry Boston motorists stuck in rush hour outside the Drizzly offices while we conducted this interview. So with that said, now back to the episode. Welcome to the podcast. We're here in Boston, Massachusetts with my boy Garav. How you doing? Garav was the founder of Buttery which was acquired by Drizzly. Yeah. Tell everyone um, what the Buttery, what it was. So Buttery was essentially a marketplace uh, and a way for liquor stores to establish like online presence and have an e-commerce store for themselves. And what, what year was this when you decided to, to move forward on this? So we started with the original idea in about 2014 when we like started exploring this problem we were like we wanted to make e-commerce easier for like small and medium businesses mm -hmm. what was but, the original idea so the original idea was uh making things easily purchasable from your local mom and pop store, or like from your local stores right okay. so if you are looking for something you're right now nowadays you would either go on amazon or online and find out where it is mm -hmm. but it's probably also available down the street from your local neighborhood store so we wanted to bring that concept of instant buying, making it easier for you to shop from your local stores. Right. And that's when we started experimenting, uh, understanding different use cases, talking to businesses and figuring out what their problems were, what are they, like, how to make this happen. And that's how we had started. So we are like all different types of businesses and we are doing a lot of things for everyone right. which was like not serving the right use case not serving the customer properly so we tried out we tried and tested a bunch of different things saw what was working how many years did you test the different the different concepts i think it was probably about a year okay uh, and at that time like we had quit our jobs we were like full-time into this yeah, before you guys were at Verizon, right? You guys yes, were... before we were like me and my co-founder, we were working together at Verizon. As engineers, you're both technical. Yeah, we, yeah. Built, we built mobile apps for streaming video solutions at that time. Yeah, and you guys were working out of Boston University? Yes. The library? Uh, when we were like playing around, like uh, test, like initially when we were like experimenting with this idea, we used to work like nights and weekends, mm -hmm. go to use like free resources, like we use library and... You yeah. make, make use of all BU's resources, which is great. When we figured out that, yes, there are some legs to, legs to what we wanted to do, mm -hmm. uh, we just quit our jobs and gave it our full shot. Yeah. So, what was yeah. that like? What was leaving your job like? Oh, it's terrifying. It's absolutely terrifying. Like, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. You're like leaving away a six-figure salary. You're figuring out how do you... Safety. How, like, there's, there's no safety net at that point, right? So, right. like, okay, what do you what do? You do? Did you guys have a little bit of savings to yeah, make your life yeah, a little yeah, bit easier? Yeah, yeah. I mean, that, that's that's what we relied on a lot. Some of our savings, yeah. our wives supported our uh, ventures pretty well. So, yeah. yeah. What kind of revenue did you have coming in at that point to... Zero. Zero. Zero, yeah. There was, there was, there was no revenue. We're still, we're still exploring what what's going to work, what's not going to work talking to different types of businesses because mm -hmm. we had quickly realized that we were doing a lot of things for like all different types of businesses, but it's not going to serve the end consumer that well. Mm. Right. right. You so, got to plant your flag. You got to like pick. Yeah. You, 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 pick you, you need to, you need to pick your, you need to pick either your vertical, you need to pick your niche and figure right. out where, 
where what you're good at and what is the best use case that you can solve for at that time we were working with one like liquor store as well uh, yeah, okay. which was again coincidentally a friend of mine so that vertical and that use case like his store started to get like more orders and people were interested in more products around that and civil so looking at that a little bit of that data we talked to more liquor stores yeah. and figured out like there is a real need for a good e-commerce platform like that in the alcohol space well at the beginning did you set out to sort of test was that always the plan that for a year you guys would just test different marketplaces and then whatever you saw signals you double down or was it just a natural progression? I think it was a natural progression. Okay. Like I'd be lying if I said we had a plan. Like we clearly didn't you don't know, know what you're doing. Yeah, we were clearly yeah. don't know what we were doing. We we're trying out different things and <laughs> figuring out what sticks, but we quickly learned along that way as well that yeah. figuring out doing a bunch of different things doesn't really work. You have mm-hmm. to really test out those things. So And so then after a year, you guys said, All right, the signals that we're getting from the alcohol market, yeah. specifically that one store. Yep. Are doing well yeah let's double down on that we we cut down everyone else uh we removed all those uh all the other businesses from our platform said sorry we couldn't yeah couldn't continue with you right now uh we our company was called scan cart before oh, that's uh, right. if you know and we had we rebranded to a little bit more like alcohol focused did a went through a whole rebrand uh relaunch got did you more, guys hire got to more do that? alcohol no, it was just us. Okay. It was just us. Like it was two of us. Uh, yeah, we got like branding help from things like um, like Odesk and like freelancers, and mm-hmm. uh, worked with a couple of friends of ours who were graphic designers with helping us with uh, like logos and branding and coloring and things like that. As soon as you have the strategy set, your yep. rebrand is done. Yep. So is I, it just about adding? So the the rebrand was a little bit more uh, a conscious effort as well. Where you're like, yes, we need a critical mass of people uh, or critical mass of the businesses to be on the platform for us to go re- like really go after end consumers. And given that this was a, a lot more like hyper local strategy. So we were like constrained in terms of like where with geographies we would like be able to operate and launch in. So we we made a conscious thing about getting stores in Boston, mm-hmm. launching in Boston. We are like, yes, we we need about eight to ten stores to be on the platform the day we launch. And at that time, we got we got a few of those stores signed up. Went when I brought them online, and I think it was sometime in twenty fifteen, like August, we launched as Buttery. And what was the pitch to the to the liquor stores? Was it hey? Here's a free way of getting you guys out there, secondary marketplace for you guys, yep. free delivery. And were they getting paid a premium to be on there? Like were they, let's say a six pack costs eight bucks. Yeah. Were they getting nine or was it? No. So uh, our main uh, value proposition to them was like they they had an online presence, but they're all their websites were mostly informational. So they would list right, their like address, in, they'll put up a map hours. and they'll be like, these are hours, here's a phone number, call us, right? Yep, yep. But they were not, uh, being able to convert that traffic into uh, a an, a buy intent, right? Right. So they don't have any e-commerce presence. Like a lot, some of them had it, but their all websites were like clunky. It's bad, yeah. Pretty bad. Um, so we offered them this new way of like not be not having to manage any of that, easy sign up, inventory integration, and be able to offer like. Uh, instant like one hour delivery as well because a lot mm-hmm. of those stores did deliveries themselves and they did it while we were operating as well so the the, the the value we offered them was instant online presence no no management at all right we get them additional orders that they wouldn't have seen outside there like a quarter mile radius from like foot traffic or whatever right uh, that and was, you're that also was you're also expanding their delivery footprint to yes. some extent yeah so if they wanted to go beyond their like immediate zip code or immediate like uh half mile radius they yeah. could have they, they can they can do however far they were willing to go were they pretty receptive i mean there weren't like as many people like not not really too concerned about it um mm-hmm. okay so it was it was fine like that that wasn't a problem like at all 
Was the delivery more of the issue for them? Delivery was an issue. A lot of people were doing delivery themselves. A lot of people wanted to get into the delivery business uh, because of the whole like e-commerce boom and like Amazon and people getting used to getting stuff delivered to them. So they were receptive of uh, establishing their own delivery as well. How were they doing it? They were just like hiring. Yeah, they they had their own employees do the delivery. Okay. They had they had drivers. The store isn't too busy. Yeah. Get in your car. Go yeah. deliver. Yeah. But then if the store gets busy, then people are waiting a long time. That was that was always a problem. When there's like in the evenings when the store's busy, they are like, oh, I can't do this order. I don't want to do this order, and they would end up canceling it. What did you guys start with? Was it mostly beer, or was it? No, it was the whole whole the entire store. The entire store. Entire store. Like okay. we we integrated with their point of sale system pulled out all the inventory from there and we had a live inventory feed going on right so every hour we would get a feed from their system push it up to their online store on buttery and it was what you see in the store with the same prices at the same quantity you would see it on online as well and i think i think you told me this but um you guys were the ones doing the delivery right yes there were definitely times where when the stores didn't want to and we wanted to keep the lights on we didn't want to have customers get like bad experience about like cancellations and what not we we went and did deliveries ourselves. We signed up with the stores like saying, "Call us when you want to." Yeah, and uh, literally, you. so you were personally driving around. Yes, me and my co-founder, both of us were like doing wow. deliveries from the store to the customers. So, did you have a a limit to how far you were willing to go? No. Like, so, <laughs> so no. someone's eighty miles away no. No. needs a bottle. Uh, eight, uh, eighty within, miles, like, yeah. We, we we did like five five sure. five seven miles, but even like five seven miles in Boston is like a is like a 45 minute drive, right? Yeah. So, yeah. Uh, it's a significant amount of time so that you're spending yeah. on the road. Yeah. Yeah. The one thing that I'm also curious about is you were clearly, you had to card them, right? Yeah. When you get to yeah. their door. Did, so, is that a, a type of training? Like, you have to know what to look for in, in a, yes. for a fake ID? Yes. So, when we signed up with the store, there were a couple of things we had to uh, do it like officially. We had mm-hmm. to undergo a it's in Massachusetts they call it like tips training like so you have to be tips certified to be able to validate the ID and make sure like in what conditions you are allowed to sell alcohol to customers in this case like hand it over or deliver to them be able to va- validate whether it's a fake ID or not uh, like all of the all the things sure. around that did you have to scan it or was it just an eyeball check yes we we had a we, we had we were using a uh, an ID scanner as well to okay. validate and yeah, we got a couple of fake IDs uh, yeah. for sure. So in that same vein, I know bartenders are tasked with cutting people off yep. if they're too drunk. Yep. Same with stores. So Is, did you ever get to someone's house and they were clearly like too drunk to to serve in a sense? Luckily, no. we didn't have that. That's, yeah. that's good. Yeah. Luckily, the only thing was we, we got presented with like fake IDs uh, sure. sometimes. So we didn't have to deal with that. But uh, we, we see that we see that here all the time. For how many years did you guys do the delivery yourselves? Uh, we were doing some for for some like we, we were doing deliveries pretty much seven, eight months before before we got acquired here. Yeah. Wow. Or at least like two plus years for sure. What was the de- the delivery fee? Like how much were you guys making per transaction? That's- so the so the agreement uh so per transaction, I mean in, in Massachusetts it's a it's a slightly gray area where either you're not allowed to take any like percentage fee on a on an order so we had like a tiered contract with them okay uh depending on like their order volume they do in during the day and for that order and things like that so it was like a flat rate based on like the order volume got it so but it was still around seven to eight percent okay yeah so you negotiated that with yes the the consumer or the, the, with store. the with the store so the customer like the end customer pays the price of the product they pay five dollars like 4.99 delivery fee and an optional tip that if they wanted to add so with the stores we had the thing like if we are doing deliveries for you we'll take that delivery fee and the tips also the commission from the orders and so after a little while of working with the stores what was the reception were they did they love it did they stores that were getting like decent amount of deliveries they they loved it they had their own website uh, personal storefront that they had like linked it up to their static websites as well so mm-hmm. they were happy that now they have an online presence that they could use they were also able to like merchandise their own products they're like hey i want to sell these as like my top selling items or like my featured items some stores of course depending on the areas and they had like less fewer orders so 
they were still like, ah, oh, it's not like as interesting because right. all they want to see is more more money, more money, right? Mm-hmm. So if they don't see that, and of course, like when you're starting out, you promise them the world. So it's like managing some of some of that as well. Some of the so, expectations yeah. there, yeah. yeah. And then at what point were you guys? Because I'm sure for you guys, you're doing the calculations, right? You're you're in year two, three, yep. four, yep. And you're thinking like, all right, is this going to scale? We're sort of educating the market, which is really what you guys are doing yep. to some extent. Yep. Was competition coming on? Was there a lot of competition at the time? There was, there was, there was good competition. Like, of course, Disney was one of the yeah. biggest, biggest competitions. Both companies being in Boston, in the, the same in the same backyard. So Drizzly was always like the big name out there in the market. A lot of our stores that we were working with as well, they were working with Drizzly as well. So they are like, whichever channel gets me like the most Best orders. Price. Like, yeah. So they were playing yeah. both sides. Oh yeah, they 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 don't they don't really they don't really care. Uh, they are like more orders from whatever orders they can get from anyone. They are they are happy with it. Uh, right. And from your perspective, were you guys thinking of raising money to try to compete? Yeah, we had like self-funded this uh, for for a while. We wanted to, even when we got to a stage where we rebranded and relaunched as Buttery, we were it was all bootstrapped, uh, self-funded operations. Uh, but yeah, we would, right after that we started out getting money, uh, like raising money. I think once you have launched, you get measured on a different yardstick, right? Like. Uh, right. If you if you are a pre if you are a pre product company if you have not launched, the parameters are different. But af- after we launched, we were everyone was like looking for like oh what's your revenue? How many consumers? Uh, what's your traction like? Uh, what's your growth? What's your growth? Uh, number of stores, number of consumers, like all those fun metrics. And then did it change your business model at one time? Because did, did, were you guys thinking like okay how do we make our business look like? appealing to these investors with some vanity metrics more markets um we 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 did a little bit of that uh towards like uh towards the end later maybe a year year and a half later where we were we were having like hard time raising money because everyone wanted to see more consumers more traction and did you so, think that was a function of being in boston or did you think it was i think it was a little bit of both it was being in boston uh drizzly being a big presence uh right your main uh, competitor main main competitor they're big, in they're, boston they have a, a yep. name yep so, so for people listening generally speaking it's harder to raise money when it comes to tech in boston Bo- the boston investment groups are typically a little bit more conservative when it when it comes to giving out money um specifically around what your finances look like. They want to see sort of a proven revenue model. Whereas in, let's say, San Francisco or Silicon Valley, they're really just betting big on the team and the idea. And if the market's big enough, and if you have no money and no traction, but they like the team and the market's big enough, they'll Mm -hmm. just go ahead and double down. Yeah. And so it's a little bit more gambling, I guess, is kind of the spectrum I put it on, but it's been very successful. And so you're dealing with these two different groups but you guys, you guys yeah. tried to raise money out in West. Yeah, we, we we not as much, not as much on the West Coast. Yeah, and so nothing really materialized. Here nothing either. materialized on the West Coast at all. And what were you guys thinking when that happened? Uh, we were just trying to find a way to keep it going. It was it was a matter Did of like. Did you deplete all your all your your oh, savings? Yeah, it was it was, yeah. it was gone. <laughs> it was it was gone a while back. Yeah. Uh, um, were these dark times for you and your co-founder? If they they were uh, okay. We 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 managed. <laughs> we figured out some family savings or whatever. All right. So you tap into your family savings, uh, and then what okay. were you thinking? Were you thinking let's just keep scaling it, or let's yeah, put we were, it on we, the we were trying to figure out a way which made made the business more appealing. We're saying, given that when you are trying to go acquire consumers, you need like you literally need money to go spend on. Like social media, SEM, right. SEO, cost of acquisition. Yeah, cost of acquisition is always there, right? So, but we went. We also tried to do it the other way around. So we we wanted to see how fast we can expand into different markets. How fast can, like can we scale our sales strategies, and whether that works or not, whether that makes it a little bit more appealing as our business to yeah. If you could prove like a payback period, type yeah, of thing, right? Yeah. So, so, so if I go into the, this new city, I inject X amount of dollars. Yep. I'm seeing that return in months. Absolutely, absolutely. Yeah, and even, even with whatever little uh, marketing dollars we were spending acquiring co- consumers, having presence in more markets, more geographies, always made it a little bit more efficient to 
uh, acquire that customer, right? So right. Uh, targeting like this one zip code in Boston versus targeting like Boston, New York, uh, LA, Chicago, like is more efficient. And also we wanted to prove out whether we can go get more stores in other cities and have a remote sales strategies work okay. and inside sales strategy work. So we gave ourselves like two months and saying, what can we do over this summer? Right. So that one summer, we are only focused on signing up stores in Washington, D.C., Austin, Chicago, Los Angeles. And we were able to launch in those four markets by just two of us signing up stores, which were which provided like our critical mass of that geography and saying, like, yes, we have coverage that mm-hmm. we can we can prove this out. And we tried to go back to investors at that time. But then it's like always a moving target, right? Like you have totally. It's fine. Like we we were not successful in fundraising from from VCs. Sure. Um, so what happened then? How how to go in the expansion? So the expansion was fine. Ex- expansion went. Did well. you have to fly there? Or was it all via? Phone? No, it was a, okay. it, it was email and phone calls. It was all inside sales. We were sitting in that BU office space that we had, and yeah, we we signed up about ten to fifteen more stores in those four markets. Yeah. And, uh, yeah, we turned them on. Uh, we were getting some organic traffic, organic traction through. Who was doing the delivery? Do the stores. The stores do the delivery. Okay. Yeah, all, all like everywhere. Like apart from one or two stores in Boston, like all of our other stores were doing their own deliveries. They had their own delivery operations. Did that change at some point, where some stores were primarily looking to you guys to do the delivery? Not really. Okay. Not really. Some of them were in Boston leaning towards that uh but at that point we were like we can't support that anymore with like the scale that we have yeah so we had to cut ties with a few of them then at what point were you guys thinking of just walking away from it and hopefully getting acquired so we we were at a point like in this was i think early 2018 like spring 2018 where we're trying to figure out like yeah what are the next steps right like if we are not able to fundraise well if you're not able to grow at the pace that we should be growing and we wanted to grow at it doesn't make any sense at in continuing the business at that point right so yeah we're trying to figure out different avenues uh talking to a few people to see whether an acquisition makes sense or just partnering makes sense as like growth partners to power somebody's like alcohol delivery and like alcohol as a vertical because sure we knew that well we're talking to different uh different people different companies uh then we got introduced to founders here at Drizzly, and we had a conversation. It was great. Uh, what did you What did you find out that you guys are doing better, if anything? Whether it's the tech, I don't know if I can point to like one certain thing that we were like doing better or worse. Uh, this is how I'll put it. I'll say, with the amount of stuff that a two people, two person company achieved in that last three years, I think that was like the best thing that we've. We did, we did right like putting all our all our sweat equity into building that company and growing that performing all the functions around like be it customer support being delivery be it tech be it, be it sales or all of that stuff with with that sort of like limited resources what we achieved at that point was i think i think our biggest achievement was there any kind of uh hit to your pride you'd started this company yep. and you had stuck with it through very thin times yes was there a sense of like, well, this is ours, I want to keep it ours, or was it just like, you know what, we need to accept that it's time to start looking for, for Yeah, I mean, there's, there's, there's always, there are always those feelings, right? Yeah. Uh, that, yeah, you've, you've put in so much effort to build something from the ground up, from, from nothing, and you're at a point where, what, like, what's the future of, what's the future of that company? But, yeah. uh, yes, it hurt, it hurt, for mm-hmm. sure, but I think it was, I think it was, it was fine. Mm-hmm. I think it was like the right outcome. I think we found like good partners to merge with. Like now we are here, which is we're solving the same problems just on a bigger scale, mm-hmm. uh, which I think is which is good. Uh, what was the process like? I don't know if we like followed any any specific process. Uh, like while talking to a people, like we start getting started getting introductions and started reaching out to people who could make introductions. Mm-hmm. So. We had we had conversations. We un- tried to understand what their vision is of their companies, what their vision uh, would be for 
us and buttery as as a product and us as uh founders joining joining a different team as well yeah um, what was that like that conversation because in some in some essence you guys were siloed right it was just you and yeah Gara yeah on your own yep chasing your dreams yep and now you're going to come into a structured environment yeah that's completely different similar but completely different yeah was that i mean what did you guys think of that i don't know i don't know i think i think it was fine like i don't think at least me personally we didn't have much concerns of going into a structured environment back again right we we, we worked at verizon for like seven eight years yeah before we started a company so we've been a part of uh, a big hundred thousand people company going back to a two-person uh operation coming on joining a hundred person company so it's not as rigid as corporate as uh like Over some Verizon. someone like verizon sure uh it's still we're still a startup here still still scratching the surface of the problem there is there is there is good opportunity here yeah and then in terms of what roles were you guys given or how did you guys decide what, what roles were available even to you we started out in engineering uh both of us uh but we wanted to do different things then got off slowly moved into leading one of the products here and uh i'm still i'm still in engineering uh but um, I, I i like what i was doing so i stayed sticked around in engineering uh leading a team got got that opportunity uh leading products uh like engineering products from like the back end retailer side of operations and how to quickly bring them online how to make them do their deliveries more efficiently and uh like all that suite of products so if you could go back good. is there something that you would do different um you have the same source of capital so the money's the same that you yeah. guys had yeah would you do what well, what is it that you think might have helped if you did a small tweak here and i don't know like right now i'm probably just guessing yeah uh totally like one 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 totally hypothetical like one thing i would have maybe done differently is probably fundraised earlier mm-hmm. uh like tried fundraising earlier before we actually launched had a product uh a pre-launch fundraising yeah uh so go would help us with like bigger team like and bring on someone with a uh, slightly more complementary skill sets yeah uh cuz both of us are engineers like product minded engineers we wanted to build products right uh maybe you could have helped with someone either with sales uh or with more like biz dev type of a person i think that would have complemented our team like much more than what we were so one of the things that i've picked up on in meeting all sorts of startups is it's 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 like heartbreaking but endearing yeah. when they talk about their let's say i'm going to call them years 2 through 6 when they were so afraid to spend money and they don't realize that if they had spent the money mm-hmm. hiring the team yep. or on these certain things they could have they could have accelerated their company a significant amount do you feel like that's with your i don't company? know if i'm in a position to make that judgment because we didn't have money right? right we had we had what we had and we had to spend it in the right thing uh so that goes back to that's why you would have fundraised yeah that that's why i may have uh attempted fundraising a little <clears throat> bit earlier uh yeah. and try to accelerate like the the team growth the product growth the traction growth all of that was there one thing that you guys saw that really made the difference when it came to delivering alcohol was it like special sales special promos around events anything like um, that really I think what it? we made easier was for a liquor store to establish their establish a website or a storefront for them right yeah they could have gone to shopify and uh mm-hmm. signed up on shopify yeah. but that's not really like alcohol specific like they would have to manage their own website by themselves uh inventory putting putting those 1000 5000 products they have in store online is is not an easy task right right so managing maintaining that sort of data accurately representing them online that's not something that they can do it on shopify themselves mm-hmm. right which is what we made it super easy we we managed a, a lot of those things uh for the stores us like we we, we did that how did you do it did you guys just have a a template that you set up or? yeah i mean a, a lot like all the all the storefronts were like on a similar template 
Once like, one core's light is the same as another one. Yeah, so yeah. I mean, like all the product de- like product metadata, images, like description, like all, and all of those things are like common across stores. So once you get it for one, it's for available for everyone else. Right. Uh, which made like scaling easier as well. With when we got new stores online, like yes, you have all of these products. I have. We have the metadata for you, right? So you don't have to so redo it all over sense. again. Yeah. Yeah. Was that valuable in the acquisition? Oh, or uh, it right? was. It was absolutely yeah. valuable. Like all the experiences that we had, like the way we did like our inventory integration, our like uh, our tech, our backend, like the operations are very similar, just on different scales. When you guys got acquired, was it was it stock? Do you have to be here for a certain amount of years or what is, what um, is that like? Yeah, I I don't want to go into too much detail about that, but yeah, it was, uh, I mean, we, we don't really have any, like, restrictions, like, per se, like, of course, okay. there's, like, vesting schedules and options and stuff. Uh, Do you guys plan to stay here for a little while? I think so. Yeah? I think so. Do you ever get the itch again to start something else? Yeah, <laughs> any other ideas floating around there's, in your head? There's, there's always ideas floating around in our head, right? Mm-hmm. Like, uh, I don't know if there's a real itch, per se, but... Yeah, you know me. Like I, I like to build build products, right? So yeah, uh, build things from scratch and see it working. That that has a that has a, like a totally different like feeling when you see see something tangible working uh, that you've created. Mm-hmm. So that's always exciting. We'll see. Right? I don't know. We'll we'll see. We'll see. Uh, for people listening, what was the pressure like at home? So you're you're doing your own startup. Mm-hmm. It's just you and your buddy. Yep. What is your wife telling you? in year three uh, they were, i think i think my wife was great uh didn't have as many complaints at all about like or like any pressure about like uh making this work until we had a kid uh which then started like then it struck hard that like okay there's now there is i think the time is running out and it was like she didn't really say that but it was always in the back of my mind per se yeah this is Right now, you have another life to take yeah, care now, of. Yeah, now you now you now you have to think about someone else as well, right? So, and did that anything change for you when that happened, in terms of your mindset around the business? Not not directly on mindset on the business, but like yeah, when when you have a newborn, you are spending a lot more time tending to them and uh, making sure they eat, sleep, poop well. So <laughs> you would of course spend not not spend as much time on business and not spend as much time working on it so you gotta find the balance all over again yep what would you what advice would you give anybody listening around uh either starting a company or scaling a company or even on getting acquired i mean what what would you i would say like if you are if you're really passionate about solving a problem just go ahead and do it like there is there is always a need if there is a problem out there in the market there are there is always a better mousetrap did you ever think about if you just lost everything, would you have cared? Lost everything about? Yeah, like if you didn't get acquired, like if it didn't work out, there was no happy. We, we 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 were fine with that as well. Like we right. yeah we, you we accepted that fate. Yeah, we 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 knew that was a realistic option, so we we were we were okay with that with that decision as well. Yeah, if that, that, that happened, outcome as well. Were there any backup plans? No, 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 <laughs> Just, <laughs> no. Go find a job. <laughs> yeah, yeah. At the end of the day, I guess yeah. you're, you're both obviously still two very talented engineers, yeah. and could easy. I would say easily get a job. Yeah. Right. Yeah. Yeah. And I guess so, that gives you the that that was that was. Yeah. I think I think uh, that was that was not as big a worry at that time in in, in my head. I, like, I, I wasn't too concerned about it. I was like, yeah, I'll, I'll find something. Where uh, where can they find? Oh, true, yeah, yeah. Where like where can people find Drizzly? Drizzly, yeah, Drizzly dot com. Uh, and what's the Instagram at Drizzly? Uh, is I think it's Drizzly Inc. Uh, yeah, D R I Z L Y I N C one Z. No, I N C. No, I know, but okay. I'm just saying there's one Z, one Z. Yeah, a lot a lot of people make that mistake, and internally we don't like really enjoy that, but. <laughs> <laughs> It's the Grizzly Drizzly. Yeah. That's another education of the market right there. Yes. Well, awesome. Thanks, brother. Thank cool. you very much. Thanks, yeah, Thank you. We here at Startup the Storefront would love to hear feedback from you. Reach out and let us know what you think, either through rating us on the podcast app or by sliding into our DMs. You can find us both on Facebook and Instagram at Startup the Storefront. Our theme song is composed by Double Touch. 
If you want to learn more about the products and businesses featured on today's episode, check out the links in the show notes. And if you enjoyed the episode, consider subscribing because we've got a lot more great guests coming up that you won't want to miss. Thanks for listening, and we'll see you next time.